Welcome to Decrypted Unscripted Revisited Podcast. This is the new incarnation of Decrypted Unscripted. I'm proud to be your host, David Bitterman. I'm a partner at Perkins Coie, and I specialize in class action litigation, including privacy class action litigation. And I'm Deb Ruffins, Chief Marketing Officer at Perkins Coie. We're going to be examining data, privacy, the landscape of data and privacy. We're going to look at regulatory developments, and we're going to look at litigation trends. So we'll be having unscripted conversations with executives, business owners, regulators, and privacy experts, where we will unpack the current data security environment on both international, national, and local levels. So welcome to Decrypted, Unscripted, Revisited, where we look at all things associated with data, privacy, and technology. And today, we are extraordinarily fortunate to have as our guest, Gwen Gerstel. Gwen was formerly the general counsel for the National Security Agency and the Central Security Service, and he's going to explain to us what the difference is from 2015 to 2020. Uh, Prior to that, for, was it 20 years, Gwen? Uh, Uh, 39, to be precise. Almost 40 years, he was a a lawyer in private practice, and Glenn's going to have to tell us how he escaped that task. Uh, He was managing partner of uh, probably five or six different offices for a major uh, multinational law firm. He's uh, been awarded various honors, including the National Intelligence Distinguished Service Medal, Secretary of Defense Medal for Exceptional Civilian Service, and the NSA Distinguished Civilian Service Medal. We're so lucky to have you, Glenn. We want to talk about a lot of things uh, national security related and disinformation related. And uh, also, you're going to tell us whether you can declassify uh, classified documents just by thinking about it. First, let me introduce you to Deb Ruffins, and then let me let you introduce yourself, Glenn. Hey, David. Great to see you again, Glenn. Nice to meet you. I'm Deb Ruffins. I'm the chief marketing officer here at Perkins Coie and just a generally curious person, especially about all things technology and security. David and uh, Deborah, thank you so much for having me on your podcast. I'm really delighted to do this. And you know, I you mentioned my long legal career, and uh, at various points during that legal career, it was interspersed with your terrific firm, Perkins, and I had the pleasure of working with uh, with your your colleagues on uh, on many transactions uh, around the world. So it's nice to be reconnected here, and thank you again. Uh, thank very you. kind of you to say. Okay, well, so. Deb, you want to start with the background? We, we always start at the very beginning. Like, where, 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 tell us where you were born and, and where you grew <laughs> up. We really do start there. The journey story is so interesting. As one New Yorker to another, I was really thrilled to see where you went to school. But uh, yeah, tell us a little bit about how you got to where you are today. Okay. Well, started uh, in New York. Uh, I was born in New York and uh, dad was a uh, relatively recent graduate of business school in those days and found a position uh, initially with Johnson & Johnson, the baby products manufacturing company. Because of that, they moved him from originally New York to New Jersey, where their head office was, and I guess still is, in New Brunswick. And then after a couple of years down to Dallas, Texas, and then back to New Jersey. And then he finally quit them and moved to uh, Denver, Colorado, and then finally wound up in New York. And I, I mention all this because as a that was all during elementary and high school years. So <laughs> I moved around a lot. Uh, and I think it, it, in retrospect, it probably had a, a role in shaping my personality. I became a little more self-reliant, independent, uh, maybe not, didn't, didn't, maybe didn't burnish my social skills as much as they should have because I was an only child and we moved around a lot. So that was a little difficult. But the flip side is, uh, I think in retrospect, it made me comfortable in new situations, which little did I realize that would prove relevant later on in life. But uh, just going to a new school and always being the new kid on the block, so to speak, uh, wasn't always easy. Um, at the time, I, I I only saw the negatives of it. But now uh, looking back, I, I realized that there, you know, there were probably some things that it taught me. And so you went to NYU and then why did you decide to go to law school? So I went to law school for one reason, no one in my family had been a lawyer. I didn't really know any lawyers at the time, other than this one reason, which is I got involved really as a just fortuity in local politics in, in New York. At, at the time, I liberal republicanism was very popular in New York. Nelson Rockefeller was the governor. Soon, um, John Lindsay was going to become the mayor. This was back in the late 60s. 
the east side of Manhattan was represented by a, a liberal Republican congressman named Bill Green, who came to my high school, which from which he had graduated years before, and said, if any of you kids are interested in volunteering in my campaign, um, please come up here and see me. My friend sitting next to me in the high school auditorium said, hey, I'm going to go up and talk to this guy. Do you want to? And I had absolutely zero interest in politics <laughs> or anything up at that point. But my friend was going up, so I followed along with him. Met this uh, congressman, Bill Green, who was the heir to the SNH Green stamp uh, fortune, wow. you may remember, a long time ago. Wow. And a uh, very nice guy, wonderful guy. Um, and I got involved in politics just sort of as a fluke, really, literally as a fluke, not something I intended to do, whatever. And I mention this because I then got involved, involved in more in more campaigns in, in New York, which is a fascinating thing to be involved in campaigns because they're a very sort of quick start operation. You can go from zero to 100, come in as a volunteer licking postage stamps, and then find yourself uh, you know, in charge of a precinct or a borough or something pretty quickly because they just desperately need very, very quickly. So I got involved in politics, and I soon discovered that at least in New York politics, um, all the senior people and the people I looked up to were all lawyers. As, a, as I was starting to finish uh, college by then, I would talk to some of my friends who were in these political campaigns, some of whom were in Nelson Rockefeller's administration and elsewhere, and say, what do you think I should do? And every one of them said I should go to law school. So I just sort of automatically decided I was going to go to law school without a lot of thought and wound up at, uh, at Columbia University uh, Law School, which was just terrific. And I, one of the reasons I picked Columbia is I wanted to remain in New York at the time. I was, again, I was very involved in politics, including at the time, a, lib a then liberal Republican organization called the Rippon Society, and I became the youngest national president of that um, oh, wow. right, while I was in, in law school. Um, and uh, it was just a fascinating opportunity. Uh, and then when it came time to go into either a law firm or a clerkship or do something else at the end of, at the end of law school, for me, the, the choice was obvious. I was going to go to the law firm where uh, some of my friends and mentors were, were senior partners, and it was a law firm that was very closely connected at the time with the Rockefeller family and the New York Stock Exchange, and that was Milbank Tweed, Hadley and McCloy. It was a wonderful firm. I applied, was, was accepted. I decided I wasn't going to become a judicial clerk. I just wanted to start work on Wall Street. Not so much that I wanted to earn money at the time. Of course, I did, but that, it, wasn't the, it wasn't as though I just was only thinking about the money. It's just that that was the pattern that some of these mentors and people I looked up to uh, were, were doing. And one of the very senior people there was uh, then um, was Robert Douglas, who was quite, quite involved in the revitalization of downtown Manhattan and was also had been counsel to, to Nelson Rockefeller, including as his assistant as uh, when he was vice president. So there were a couple people there and it just seemed like a, a natural fit. And only later, a couple of years later, did I realize, hey, wait a minute, I actually like the practice of law too. But the reason <laughs> I went there, as I said, was just this rather unthinking, just putting one foot forward in front of another, following in the path that some of these people I looked up to had, uh, had led before. Did you stay involved in politics too while you practiced law? Yes and no. Uh, so no surprise, the first year of or a couple of years of being an associate at a Wall Street law firm is something like a 25-hour-a-day op operation, and that didn't leave too much time for politics. So after just a year or two, I really wound down the politics. And that coincided um, roughly, not exactly, with the time when the Republican Party started edging more and more, becoming more and more conservative, moving to, uh, to Ronald Reagan, away from Gerald Ford, et cetera, et cetera. I felt the party was sliding to the right under me, and uh, so I got less interested in uh, political matters then, and also my legal career was starting to become more all-consuming. I wound up being transferred as an associate down to the Washington office, where I had the incredible good fortune of having as a mentor Elliot Richardson of Watergate fame, and wow. uh, he, he sort of took me under his wing, and I just felt unbelievably privileged to, to be able to literally work day after day directly with him. And then after that, I kept telling my wife, well, I'll probably stay at the law firm for a year or two. Uh, my wife, whom I had met at Columbia Law School also, uh, I'll stay at the year law firm a year or two, and then I'll go do something interesting. And then two years would come by, and she'd say, well, what are you up to? And I said, well, just give me another year or two, and I'll sort it out. Well, next thing you know, we went to Washington. Then we were sent by my law firm to Singapore, then to Hong Kong, and then back to Washington. And somewhere along the way, I lost my lost sight of my two-year goal to leave. <laughs> do, do you have any idea what you would have done had you left? Not at all, but uh, there were all sorts of points at the time. 
when investment banks were a very attractive lure. This was in the sort of 90s when uh, investment banks were stealing all sorts of people from the big Wall Street law firms to as, as investment banking exploded. And I, I toyed with that and had a couple of sort of unsolicited offers to do that. But at any given moment, the work I was doing, the kind of clients I had, the nature of my work and travel around the world was just so unbelievably fascinating. Uh, and, and of course, I was also by then a partner. It wasn't clear that I'd have any better life moving to an investment bank. And I was already having a wonderful time uh, being a lawyer at a, at a big firm working on just fabulous transactions. How do you make the transition? This is what we're really interested in because I'm, I'm always looking for an, uh, a, a parachute here and an escape <laughs> valves. I'm curious as to how you found yours. Well, after we moved back to Washington, I thought, okay, now that I've had this wonderful legal career serving overseas, uh, working on fabulous transactions around the world, now I can go back to my first joy of, of government and politics and public policy. So um, I kept thinking that maybe I would somehow join the federal government. I did a little bit of volunteer work for the local government. The District of Columbia government is, was appointed um, on a number of boards and commissions for the local government. And that sort of continued to keep my appetite for public service uh, sharp and interesting. But again, at any given moment, the law firm was always far more exciting and attractive. And I don't only mean financially, although, of course, that was that's a factor too, but just that uh, I was working on fabulous transactions, helping uh, bring telecommunications and cellular capability around the world because I was very involved in project finance. And uh, that was just fun to be involved in something that was leading to a, a wonderful thing, bringing, uh, in, in effect, telephone uh, connectivity to people in India, Thailand, around the world, South America. So... I kept, again, deferring the idea that I would do some public service until finally uh, I belatedly realized, gosh, my law firm has a mandatory retirement age of 65, <laughs> and here I am about 60, and I better start thinking about it because this is coming up in five years, and I haven't been successful at my two-year plan, so I better now really <laughs> concentrate on doing what I'm going to do when I'm 65. And I started – Knocking on doors um, then in the – this was then the sort of first term of the Obama administration. And I wound up becoming appointed um, to the president's National Infrastructure Advisory Council, which was a, a, a volunteer part-time thing. But it introduced me to the federal government work at a more serious level. And that was fascinating and worked with a number of really terrific people and had significant interactions with the Department of Homeland Security, which was quite new at the time, of course. And that, again, continued to burnish my appetite for doing something more substantive. And so finally, uh, as I was starting to approach this mandatory retirement age, I got serious about knocking on doors in Washington saying, hi, I would love to work in, in uh, the federal government in some form. Uh, and I uh, discovered that it's very hard to get a job in the second term of an administration because there's <laughs> always someone who is the deputy assistant something or other who's now moving up to become the the secretary of paper clips or whatever the yeah. title was. And every time I would jump up and tell the personnel office, hey, I could do paper clips too. They said, well, that's okay, but we've already got three people in line in front of you. So it was very, I was a little disappointed that I, I wasn't able to find any job until almost as a fortuity, a friend of mine who was then the general counsel of the Pentagon called up and said, I should apply for a vacancy as the general counsel of the National Security Agency. And my first words back to, to my friend Stephen were, are you sure you dialed the right number? <laughs> um, because I just couldn't possibly see myself in this, in this job that I would know nothing about in an incredibly secret world of, of the national security. And he said, no, you've got law firm experience. You've managed law firms. You've traveled overseas. You have lots of international background. Uh, you've got a public policy background and you could, you could do this. So I said, okay. So I put my name in the hopper and without spending the rest of the podcast telling you all the ins and outs and how it wound up there, suffice it to say that one day I, to my great surprise, I got a call after a series of interviews that I didn't think went well <laughs> from, uh, from Admiral Michael Rogers, then the director of the National Security Agency saying, Glenn, we'd love to have you come on board as the general counsel, which was a wonderful opportunity. And I turned down some other things that had arisen in the meantime in the Obama administration um, and, uh, and, and took that position. So I felt just incredibly privileged and incredibly lucky to have that opportunity. I might add it was a civil service position for which you had to, in effect, compete. But, but because it was at a very senior level, a lot of the comp competitive issues were, were waived as, as is permitted under law. 
so I was, I was selected for the position, but you had to go through a panel and through a procedure, but it was, it was a senior civil service position. And the significance of that is that had I been appointed to a political position, I would have had to leave at the end of the Obama administration. And I ended up being uh, continued under the Trump administration for a number of years uh, in, in this civil service position because it precisely because it wasn't a political position, which I think is exactly right. Um, let me just add that the two there are two very senior legal positions in the federal government that aren't Senate confirmed. All the general counsels of every big department are Senate confirmed. The general counsel of the CIA is Senate confirmed, presidentially appointed, and the two that are fiercely non-political and not subject to Senate confirmation are the General Counsel of the Federal Bureau of Investigation and the General Counsel of the National Security Agency. Those are the only two in that. And I think that's exactly the right right approach, I might add. Well, tell us, those of us who are far far distant from Washington and see a lot of acronyms, and we, we, we know what the CIA does, we know what the FBI does, but what, what does the National Security Agency do specifically? The National Security Agency has a very clear mission uh, in two areas, one of which is well known and the other of which is less heralded, but but increasingly significant. And the, the one that we all know about, of course, is uh, that is in charge of doing electronic surveillance for foreign intelligence purposes. It does not operate in the United States in terms of doing surveillance or targeting in the United States. Uh, it's, it's aimed at gathering foreign information using electronic surveillance and um, that's that's its focus. There are other agencies of the intelligence community uh, that that have human agents, such as you know spies, such as the CIA, which is an also called all source agency. That's not the National Security Agency. It's just focus on one collecting electronic surveillance from all forms of electronic communication. And again, it's foreign oriented. Um, does not have a domestic program. And indeed, one of my responsibilities as the general counsel was to ensure that that was the case. And I can tell you right away, I never had an occasion where there was even anything close to a question about it. Um, the, the agency is scrupulously careful to, to make sure its operations are all targeted offshore. The second thing that the National Security Agency does, and this goes back to its origins as helping to protect the Pentagon, the Department of Defense's own networks and security systems and weapon systems and codes, um, is, is a cybersecurity mission. Originally, this was just focused on protecting the Department of Defense, including everything from the chain of command, the communications command from the president to nuclear bombers and missiles and making sure the, that that particular chain of communication is absolutely positively uh, secure and, and not subject to uh, any, any disruption or spoofing or anything like that, um, to just uh, communications and codes used by the, by the Department of Defense. And because of that background and because, of course, Knowing how to penetrate a network, which is one side of the NSA house, is equally valuable in knowing how to defend, which is the other side of this. Uh, and each side informs the other side of the house. The National Security Agency now has a much broader role in generally assisting in cybersecurity within the Department of Defense and also collaborating with the Department of Homeland Security and all the rest of the apparatus that we now have to deal with uh, with, with cybersecurity, which, which goes back to this historic distinction. But, but NSA, I mean, we can even talk a little bit about the, how the authorities are dispersed, but, but NSA is principally responsible for cybersecurity of the Department of Defense and this foreign intelligence mission. So I'm curious about two, two quick things. Security and telecommunications are connected, but perhaps distantly. So I'm wondering if you're, and you were an attorney, you were, an, were not a technologist, of course, but I'm wondering how much that helped you when, in your role as general counsel for NSA. And I'm also curious if you had to get security clearance. Oh, the security clearance is easy because you can't walk into that building uh, and you have to go through an armed barbed wires, uh, check two, I guess, three checkpoints to get into the uh, main building of the National Security Agency in Fort Meade, Maryland, which is just outside of Washington. And then you have to go through a turnstile with an electronic code that uh, has imprinted in a card that you get. So you've got to go through a full security clearance and indeed a, a, a polygraph, a, a you know, sort of a lie detector examination. So it's it's quite an elaborate process, takes a couple of months. Um, and then I end up with, uh, along with many other people, having this uh, top secret security clearance. But also, uh, to your point, uh, Deborah, um, having a uh, background, because I was a, a lawyer who focused heavily on the telecommunications industry, I certainly felt, although I absolutely was didn't have the technical background or an engineering background. I felt because I had been around so many of those people as clients and in deals, I just felt comfortable in the technological area and certainly aware of the role of innovation in that area and, and how 
uh, things could get so disrupted by new technology. So I, I felt comfortable in that area. Again, there was always a lot to learn, so that's absolutely the case. But I started I started uh, with a with a bit of a base. Yeah, it made you the man for the job at the time. Yeah. And so, but we, we have to talk about cybersecurity now. And so in terms of cybersecurity, so, some of our guests say, hey, listen, cybersecurity is not an issue. It's it's like mutually assured destruction. If no, no, we're not going to knock out someone else's utility networks because because they're going to knock out ours. And, and it's it, everyone's just holding back. Others have told us it's not even an issue because the only people that really know how to do it are these these thugs, these ransomware criminals that are tolerated in, in Russia, and uh, the nation states really don't get engaged in that. That seems to be contradicted by what we're seeing in with the Ukraine. But I'd be just curious about, A, what level of activity is there by nation states in, in potential cyber attacks, cybersecurity? And then, two, what, is, what are the risks that we face? I don't think there's any doubt that our society as a whole is tremendously vulnerable in the cyber area. And the more we rely on digital devices uh, in every aspect of our daily, everyday lives and commercial lives, uh, the more vulnerable we are. So the fact of adoption and penetration and ubiquity leads leads to vulnerability. Uh, and we're vulnerable for some very obvious reasons, uh, which is that probably oversimplifying a bit, but, but the internet and uh, most digital devices these days uh, weren't built with security in mind. They were not designed to deal with the misuse and evil use of technology. Uh, it was uh, taken as a just as a good thing, and nobody really security was sort of bolted on afterwards. And, and we're living with the consequences of that decision right now. Uh, we're making great strides in fixing things, but. Uh, the fact of the matter is that the, the fundamental technology of the internet and the absence of, say, user authentication in order, in order for you to get on the internet, you don't need to prove. I don't need to prove when I get in the internet on any way, whether I'm using a cell phone, a laptop, a, or even my thermostat to connect to the internet. I don't need to prove that I'm Glenn Gerstel. We could have had a system where that where user authentication was, a, was an element of it. We could have had a system where everything that's connected to the internet was certified as secure. When you plug a a toaster into the electric grid these days, it has a little label on it. It says UL, under, Underwriters Laboratory, right? Someone's made sure that the thing isn't going to short circuit and catch a fire, cause a fire. We could have had a system that in effect did that, uh, that before you bought software, it was certified as free of bugs, that before you got a piece of hardware, it was certified as not having spout, spyware or malware or something in it. And again, we don't have that system. It, not necessarily a bad thing because we got all sorts of other wonderful benefits from from having a a more easily operated and free and innovative system, but that's the trade off. So that vulnerability in the cyber area is only going to get worse because of increased use of digital devices due to the digital revolution. And then our adversaries are increasingly sophisticated, and whether that's nation states, four in particular were the focus of my efforts at the National Security Agency and, and those of the intelligence community, and that's Russia, China, North Korea, and Iran, who are particularly adept uh, at, mo at actors at uh, malicious uh, at cyber maliciousness, um, but also ransomware gangs and common criminals. The, the barrier to, to entry, so to speak, to do malice is very easy. You can operate anywhere in the world. You can operate in many cases with impunity if you can't be caught or tracked. The cost of ease of doing so is very simple. You can go online uh, on the dark web and buy a malware kit, a spyware kit, a ransomware kit. You can join chat groups with ransomware gangs and sell data Ill illegally and improperly. So it's a very, very easy way to break into criminal activity and, and cyber mischief, uh, let alone um, a, a malicious activity on a nation state level, say, to disrupt or cause harm. Uh, so the, the problem is going to get worse before it gets better. I think long term, although you haven't really asked this, I'm going a little beyond your question, but long term, I think we will surmount the problem, but we're still in the days where it's going to get worse before it gets better. Is there a legal or regulatory framework in place that really can neutralize or combat these kinds of threats? Not yet is the short answer. Again, if we take a step back uh, and think about other technologies that became important in everyday life or commercial life, and we look at them, whether it's aviation or electricity or radio, television, whatever, the automobile, they all took decades 
from the time they were invented to the time they became a pervasive factor in everyday life. And over those decades, we had the time to sort out the rules of the road, whether it was going to be public or private, whether we were going to have mandatory safety uh, requirements, uh, whether um, it was going to be something of subject to industry regulation or government, and we were able to organize government in a way to, to address it. And a good example is the automobile, which, although invented in the very, very late 19th century, um, really became significant only sort of in terms of everyday life, sort of after World War II, and everybody had a car by the, by the time of the 50s and 60s. And sure enough, it took until the 1960s before seatbelts became mandatory as a matter of federal law, fought by the industry, I might add, for a number of decades, um, and fought by many others as an intrusion on their liberty and in interfering with their, their freedoms and so on and so forth. And now we just totally take it for granted, right? There's no nobody gets into a car and doesn't even... Because it's so common and so ubiquitous, we, we forget that the these digital devices in our digital life is, is relatively new. I mean, Facebook, although founded in... 2004 really didn't become a thing in our life until, say, maybe 2010. Um, the iPhone was first introduced only in 2007. So it's no surprise that we've really only had, what, pick a number, 10, 15 years, maybe 20 years of, of significant digital activity. So this revolution has occurred far faster than these other technological revolutions. And it's no surprise that our government has, has been slow to respond and our society has been slow to respond. Remember the days when email was, I'm old enough to remember the days when email was a new thing. Mm -hmm. And one of the big things was, how do you write an email? Do you say, dear? Do you sign it? Yours, yours sincerely and truly. And there were all these little tiny social norms that people had to work out. And how is it different from chatting on a on a on an app? And so, no surprise that it's taken uh, and will continue to take a number of years before we sort this out and have the right level of regulation. And we are headed to more regulation in this area. Uh, that's inevitable because of the vulnerabilities. This is just something that's going to take a, a decade or two. It's not going to be solved overnight. I think long term, well, we will get ahead of the problem, but it's it's not going away soon. I remember the raging debates about whether or not fax, facsimile transmissions were legally binding contracts, signatures. <laughs> sure, sure. And you could, and just to elaborate for a second, I mean, you could look at other uh, other technologies. Uh, maybe we can also want to talk about disinformation for a second. But um, you know, the air the airplane was invented uh, what in the early nineteen uh, early nineteen hundreds, and by the time of the twenties or so, it was fairly relatively common. It was a not that everyone was flying, but just that. Airplanes were were regulated to the extent they were regulated all almost all exclusively by states, and then it took a, a really significant public crash in uh, in 1931 involving Newt Rockney, the famous uh, Notre Dame football coach. It was sort of front page news around the country that he had been killed in an airplane crash, and sure enough, right after that, weeks later, Congress introduced a bill that created the what is today the National Transportation Safety Board, but it took an accident. Um, it took the Iroquois fire in uh, 1903 when hundreds of women and children were burned to death in Chicago due to an electric spark, an electric arc that led to uh, national fire codes and the formation of the Underwriters Laboratory and making sure that our electric grid didn't catch fire all the time. So, we haven't had that kind of event and we probably won't in the digital world because it's it, it's not susceptible to a one-time fire. But, um, you know, we've had some scares, colonial pipelines and solar winds and others, and they're they're pushing us to more regulation and doing something about the problem. But it, it does take something to get a democracy to do that. You referred us to an article that you wrote in the New York Times, uh, quote, I've dealt with foreign cyber attacks. America isn't ready for what's coming. I just maybe you could just distill for our listeners what you think the solution should be in terms of a, a more organized approach to this threat. Organized approach is ex exactly the right term, David, because our adversaries are organized. Um, most of our adversaries are authoritarian states that are able to harness the public sector and private sector jointly together in pursuit of their state objectives. You have countries such as Russia where dissembling and disinformation and cyber maliciousness is just part of what the government does. It is a tool of their statecraft. They're organized in a very, very cohesive way. We're, we're, we're not used to that in the United States. Our, our federal government is dispersed among many agencies. It doesn't necessarily coordinate well across the entire federal government. We certainly don't do that in, in, in the country in our private sector, which is 
deliberately for all sorts of good reasons, very separated from, from the federal government. That we, we want it that way. Uh, and certainly that's the opposite of what we see in Russia and China, where the, the private sector acts at the state bidding. So we're not used to an integrated, coherent, coordinated onslaught from some of these foreign countries because we're not organized that way. Um, the private sector, uniquely now for the first time in our history, bears the burden of our national security because they're in charge of our private infrastructure. They're in charge of our infrastructure. The private sector is the one that controls the keys to the economy. So that for the first time in our lives, uh, or I should say the first time in our, our nation's history, our national security rests with the private sector far more than the government. I mean, yes, of course, we need to have missiles and bombs to make sure North Korea doesn't attack us, but um, we're far more likely to suffer a, a harm to our national security from someone taking down the electric grid or interfering with Visa or MasterCard or the New York Stock Exchange or what have you from a cyber attack than we are from a, I believe, from a North Korean missile. Not, again, not that we don't need to be worried about that too, but but our, our federal government isn't organized that way. Our, our nation isn't organized that way. We're not used to dealing with integrated adversaries that operate that way. So what we need, I think, over time is to move to a some kind of central regulation scheme where one entity in the United States government, I've proposed something like something that would look like the Securities and Exchange Commission, maybe have Republicans and Democrats, presidency appointed, Senate confirmed, whatever, that would be sort of the National Cyber Commission, if you want to call it. And it would, it would take up pieces of what is now currently dispersed among the National Security Agency, my old agency, the Department of Homeland Security, and the and CISA, the the unit that now focuses on uh, private sector security and, and polices the rest of government, uh, the civil side of government, along with the National Cyber Director, a new post uh, created in the federal government, and, and other, and and then take an integrated approach to cyber, because after all, the problems are common. In other words, if you're a company in the industrial sector, uh, in, in the agricultural sector. Uh, operating a Windows uh, software, it's the same vulnerability that you have if you're a company in the aerospace industry operating a Windows software. So the problems are common, the adversaries are common, and yet our response is not common. We have individual departments that are responsible for overseeing specific sectors. And while it's definitely true that we need to tailor things to indu specific industrial sectors and we can't have a one-size-fits-all approach to cyber, uh, nonetheless, we spend far more time coordinating and organizing and, and doing things in spite of our organization than because of our organization. And the perfect example is just look at Congress. There are over 80 committees and subcommittees that have some cyber jurisdiction. And you know what happens when 80 people are in charge. No one's in charge. Yeah. <laughs> it's interesting you, you mentioned that we haven't had a major event. I mean, I, I would think if you've basically had the Russians try, seriously trying to influence a, an election, whether they succeeded or not, they certainly tried really hard to influence this election. And then we did have cyber wins. We had Cambridge Analyticals. We had all those events. Aren't those sufficient to sort of raise the level of concern such that people would start to, the government would start to think about ways to address it? Yes. And, and to be fair, in the last say, five, six, seven years, we've made major strides in this area uh, precisely because of the uh, focus on cyber vulnerabilities raised by the very points, the very, very uh, attacks and hacks that you just mentioned, uh, Colonial Pipelines, the JBS uh, meat producing company, uh, SolarWinds, et cetera. So as a result of that, and, and earlier there was a commission formed, the Cyberspace Solarium Commission which made a series of recommendations, many of which have been adopted. Congress is now beefing up funding for the Department of Homeland Security. The, the intelligence community is far more focused on cyber than it was 10 years ago. So there's no question that our government and our society, think of how, how the private sector is responding with every company now having a CISO and making sure their board of directors is focused on uh, cyber matters. So there's, there's no question that we're making great strides. But uh, in a democracy, things move slowly. Governments don't get reorganized uh, uh, very easily. There's tremendous resistance to creating a new cyber. There was, there was significant resistance to creating the position of the national cyber director. But imagine the differences of opinion over creating an entirely new department in the federal government to deal with just cyber. Um, that, that may not come to pass ever. I, I think something like that is needed. Um, and again, go back to my congressional example. What's what's the odds of getting 80 
congressional committees to give up their jurisdiction in favor of just one. In the case of the intelligence arena, it took 9-11, a really dramatic shock to our nation to cause uh, us to create the Department of Homeland Security and for us to you know, really focus intelligence uh, in two particular committees in the, um, in the House and Senate. And the only way to do that is, is everybody sort of gives up jurisdiction in favor of one. The problem is in the cyber area, while we may have these attacks like colonial pipelines and solar winds, they don't necessarily have a national effect. That's probably a good thing, of course. And it isn't clear how damaging they are. Yes, it involves financial loss, but that's sort of dispersed. Insurance covers some of it. No one person's really responsible. It's not like, God forbid, a hurricane or someone's life being killed. So if we ever get to a point, and I fear we may, where attacks on operational technology produce real world harms, hospital shuts down and is really down and people, God forbid, lose their lives over it, that may create the impetus for that kind of... Um, action we need. Uh, if, if, if an adversary was ever capable of completely shutting down for 24 hours the New York Stock Exchange, yes, we or, or pick whatever big financial network you want, yes, that might produce uh, that result and, and be the, the, the spark needed to make really dramatic change. But if we're lucky, on one hand, we won't have such an event. I mean, you could say well, maybe we need an event to create something, but of course, no one wants any harm uh, of any nature whatsoever, whether it's financial or, or physical. You know, we need an event for public awareness, but you were talked a moment ago about the kind of dispersion and how much of it is in private sector. And I kind of think that like the American Bar Association and the Chamber of Commerce and the, you know, technology or financial you know, associations that oversee these huge industries that are largely impacted would come together around something like this simply for cost and liability reasons. Well, you're right, uh, Deborah. There, there are definitely great strides being taken in that area and we should we should compliment them and keep keep up that that terrific work uh, by all sorts of organizations. In, industrial uh, sectors get together and form information sharing uh, alliances with, within the industry. The cybersecurity vendors all work together in a far greater way and collaborate with the federal government, uh, CISA, the Cybersecurity Infrastructure Security Agency uh, within the Homeland Security uh, within the Department of Homeland Security works very closely with the FBI and NSA in ways that they didn't just a few years ago. So, I, I don't want to minimize the fact that we're taking good and important steps toward greater public-private collaboration in this area, but we've got a long way to go. We don't have we don't have really current real-time information sharing. We don't have systems to do that. People are le quite legitimately worried about privacy and government involvement and so on and so forth. And just the fact that our private infrastructure is dispersed across so many hands, separate water utilities, separate transportation utilities, whatever. In one hand, the good part of that is it's sort of hard to have a really sustained attack because, you know, we've got 10,000 election jurisdictions. We've got 50,000 water utilities around the country. So attacking at scale is really hard. Um, but the flip side of that is it's also hard to get them organized and coordinated. So there's there's pluses and minuses to the way our society is organized. It's interesting because some of our guests have said that, you know, we have the capability of taking down some power grids in some major countries and our adversaries do also. And we're, no one's going to do it or that it hasn't been done yet because the same reason there's not there hasn't been a nuclear attack of one kind or another. It's just, it's going to be too dramatic and too extreme and, and cause too much harm. Is that, is there any truth to that? I think there's some truth to that, but I don't know that that's the whole explanation here. So first of all, it's difficult to take down, to have a real pronounced long-term enduring effect in the physical world. And I think one of the lessons we've seen come out of the Ukraine conflict is that Cyber is a good offensive weapon, but it doesn't necessarily produce persistent, enduring, strategic benefits. Most of the attacks we've seen in the digital world have involved information, stealing data, corrupting data, turning computers off, but not producing a so-called physical world, a real world effect with, with electric grids being turned off, uh, valves in a chemical plant being opened up, sluice gates in a dam being, uh, being opened. That's possible. But again, it wouldn't necessarily produce a long, uh, produce a national effect. You might, I mean, you could have horrific flooding if if a dam gate was opened in, inappropriately, of course, and that's not something we should 
trivialize, but but it isn't necessarily going to produce a strategic national effect. So I think one of the reasons we haven't seen adversaries really disrupting our, our national grid is it's hard to do. It's hard to have a national effect. And what would be the strategic advantage? I mean, think of even now, just take this current situation of Vladimir Putin, I'm sure would love to strike back at the United States. But even if he could have the GRU, his military intelligence unit, seek to affect the electric grid in the United States, even if he could, and I'm, I'm, and I'm not sure he could, although some parts are surely vulnerable, but what would be the strategic value? What would be the benefit he'd get? He'd certainly uh, enrage the American population and cause us to double down on sanctions. We're, we're not going to say, oh, well, if you're going to do that, uh, fine, we'll forget the sanctions. Of course, we're not going to say that. So the strategic benefits produced by offensive cyber, I think, are actually somewhat limited. Not not zero. And and in the right place and right time, governments could could use them in in the context of uh, of uh, of warfare. They have their place. But to think that it's some sort of magic weapon that's going to completely change the outcome of of, uh, of a conflict, I, I think, is is unlikely. In, in, in addition to the point you mentioned, David, which is the sort of mutual deterrence point that if they do it, we'll do it, and that has a role, of course, in in the calculations as well. And yet, disinformation is powerful. You alluded to that. I wonder if you could expand a bit on, you know, good examples or you know how is it more dangerous than perhaps the strategic impacts. Sure. I actually think I'm one of those people who thinks that the the of all the cyber maliciousness, um, the thing that is most concerning is disinformation, which I think is very pernicious and ultimately is our is the true national security uh, threat. Yes, attacks on information technology are serious. Ransomware is definitely a serious problem, but they're limited in scope, and there's sort of ways that uh, that some of our adversaries. It's hard for our adversaries to do. It's hard to have a real strategic impact. And some of them um, have their hands tied in some way. For example, one of our adversaries on some level, our competitor is China. And China doesn't want to risk the fact that 17% of their their GDP is uh, or, and their trade is associated with um, with the United States. They are the second largest holder of American debt uh, after, after Japan, over I think over a trillion dollars. So it would be foolish for them to be to do something that would uh, attack the United States that would jeopardize their position and force sanctions on China, for example. That would be harmful to us, but it would be really harmful to them. There are limits on, as I said, on this cyber offensive action. On the other hand, there aren't those limits in the case of disinformation, in part because um, attribution is so difficult, and also the effect is so more is so much more diffuse. There's no uh, there's no one specific outcome that you can point to. Um, but we do know that it has an effect, and the five-volume bipartisan uh, report of the Senate after the 2016 election made clear that Russia clearly had an effect on our elections. We can't measure it. We don't know. But I'll just cite one statistic that shows the possibility, which is that a change of just 80,000 votes in three states um, would have made Hillary Clinton president instead of Donald Trump. Is it possible that Russian disinformation affected 80,000 people? I don't know. Who knows? Maybe we'll never know. Um, but it's something to think about and something to be worried about. And when we have a situation where something approaching 40% of the people at one point honestly thought that President Biden was not was not the duly elected president of the United States due to disinformation online, both foreign and domestically generated, that's a problem for our democracy. Whether you're a Republican or Democrat, it doesn't make a difference. It, it, we can't have the legitimacy of our institutions be undermined by online disinformation, whether foreign generated, and they are very, very good and focused at exploiting existing divisions in the United States or domestically generated. Let me just give you one quick example of how a domestic division was inflamed by Russia. In October 2020, there were terrible wildfires. You may or may remember in Oregon and Washington. I do. For some reason, I live here. <laughs> For some reason, some guy decided that he was going to post on Facebook that he wondered whether Antifa uh, was setting these fires as arson in order to disrupt uh, in order to disrupt uh, lives in in the Pacific Northwest, and that uh, and that uh, the, the, the that these radical groups were setting arson fires. This was picked up by other Facebook posts and Twitters, and sort of took a little bit of a life on its own, but didn't didn't really have much of an effect until. Russia got hold of it, and they watch our internet like a hawk and look at look at what we are producing online, our American citizens, given our free speech and we can say anything. And they took this, and boy, did they amplify it. They had their fake Facebook posts amplify this 
restate it. They had their fake Twitter accounts with fake personas generated by artificial intelligence repeat this and say on Twitter, oh, there's this big story on Facebook. Then they had Facebook posts that say there's this big story on Twitter. Then they had RT, Russia, Russia Today, report on the fact that all of these people were talking about it, giving it a sense of legitimacy and corroborating it. And they had more Facebook posts talking about that RT was reporting on it. So pretty soon, it started reaching thousands of people, not necessarily millions, but thousands of people in Oregon, some of whom got so upset at seeing all this that they set up roadblocks to catch the Antifa arsonists. I remember. The roadblocks got so severe that they backed up people who were evacuating from wildfires, trying to get out to safety. It got so bad that the Douglas County Sheriff in Oregon reached out to the FBI and said, let's issue a joint statement urging people not to believe this disinformation online. Do not set up roadblocks. This is not caused by Antifa protesters. It's a naturally occurring phenomenon and you're causing a public safety problem. Well, imagine there's an earthquake in California, God forbid, and Russia decides to publish a list of hospitals that are closed and not affected or that are open. And it's wrong. When does disinformation cross the line into, or like, or maybe there, it always is, can you like uncover when it's a psychological operation? I mean, it sounds like some of these things are intended to get people to behave in a certain way that is adverse to everybody's interests. Sure. I mean, you know, there's a whole range of, there's no one point, it's sort of a spectrum range of gray, shades of gray, so to speak, Deborah. but you're absolutely right. So I think Russia has as its goal... Uh, several goals. They, they, you know, at the highest level, they want to gain strategic influence over U.S. political decision making and public opinion. But they're perfectly fine in one way of doing that is by spreading confusion and generating exhaustion and apathy, having people not vote because they think, oh, it doesn't matter. It's all corrupt anyway. They want to undermine public confidence in our in our democratic institutions. They're constantly attacking our judiciary and saying it's rigged. And okay, most people don't believe and don't see this Russian propaganda, but some percent do, and it has an insidious effect. And, and they just generally want to exacerbate um, existing divisive issues uh, in the United States. And so they've been all over racial issues, social class, these various fights that our, our society is perfectly capable of generating on its own. <laughs> um, so I don't think we can underestimate just how pernicious and what an effect this could have and and uh, how vulnerable we are, especially given the absence of civic education and the absence of some digital literacy uh, that enables our population to recognize this. And we could look at some other countries and, you know, a good example to some extent is uh, places like Finland and Estonia where they are, and Latvia, where they are subject to an onslaught of Russian disinformation. And they've developed, developed some resilience against it. They, they know how to spot it. And their citizen, citizens are alert to this. Uh, we're not there yet. Do they have agencies uh, focused on disinformation? I was really disappointed when, when Biden pulled back on that effort recently. So we have a, uh, a wonderful benefit in the form of the First Amendment. Um, but it also, uh, and I wouldn't recommend taking away one molecule from it at all. So that's not that's not my point. But but the fact is that that amendment has led the Supreme Court to say, since we're on a legal panel here, has led to say that one of the consequences of the First Amendment is that Americans have the absolute right under the Constitution to receive foreign disinformation, and the federal government uh, is not allowed to stop that. And of course, I don't think given our culture and society, we'd want that. I might add, if we lived in Singapore or if we lived uh, elsewhere in an authoritarian, let alone an authoritarian place, but there are democratic societies that do not have the same approach and do have uh, limits on um, what you can say online and have the government police that. We don't want that for all sorts of good reasons, um, but that creates a challenge and that puts the burden on the citizens and on the public sector and to some extent respond and uh, the government but at the end of the day, it's all about responsible public citizenry, uh, from whether from our elected officials or individuals, uh, because we are not going to have a situation where the government is going to sort through disinformation and say, yes, this is okay. No, that's not okay. Uh, the price of that for us is too high, but we have to pay the consequence. Well, that, yeah, that's what I was going to ask you. That's, that seems like it's a harder problem to tackle than, than the technical issues associated with cyber attacks. Completely agree. And the thing about the cyber attack is, is we know how to fix it. This is not a case. Doctors are standing over a patient saying, 
we have no idea what the problem is. We can't figure out this, what this disease is or what the problem is with these organs. And we have no cure. We don't even know. We, we, all we know is these, you know, the patient is sick. That's not the case in cybersecurity. Uh, we know exactly how to cure the problem. We, we know how to fix malicious cyber attacks and how to prevent our software from being corrupted. It would require bug-free software. It would require a different approach to things. Maybe that's too expensive. It's too difficult, et cetera, et cetera. But we know how to do it. This is not a problem. This is not a technical problem. It's an implementation and expense and public policy problem. That is not the case in disinformation. We do not have the tools to fix and cure and prevent disinformation. That's the big challenge there. Yeah, I'd love to talk about uh, Section 230 and all that. But before you go, we have to talk about Mar-a-Lago and what's okay. going on down there. Yeah, I know you've got some strong views about that. And maybe you could give us an overview and then we could ask some specific questions because we, we can't leave without talking about that today. Sure. I've been commenting a fair amount about it. And I'm trying to stay away from the political side of it. Obviously, there are people who, in the case of supporters of President Trump who believe this is all politically motivated and a witch hunt and so on and so forth. And there are other people on the other side who think that, that former President Trump has committed horrible crimes and should be you know, indicted, et cetera, et cetera. So I'm, I'm trying to move away from the political side. There's, there's rich discussions about it, but let's take that aside. I'm just approaching it as a, someone who was involved in our national security affairs and understands the significance of having national security information be potentially compromised. When I was at the National Security Agency um, uh, and, and serving in the intelligence community, there were a number of such circumstances where information that was secure and classified got out, either because someone leaked it to the press or because someone took some information home. And in each case, the intelligence community had one important duty, which is to say, let's figure out what could or did happen as a result of this information being released. And in the case of some top secret information, it, it could have a real world effect. It could mean that the identities of, of foreigners who cooperate with us in, in, in adversarial regimes might be revealed and they could get their heads chopped off. It could mean that some of our agents who are covert agents operating in some place might have their identities compromised and we better pull them back, before, pull them out before they get caught. Um, it could mean that codes uh, that are used to operate weapon systems or other other technical aspects um, could get compromised so that if we were actually in a shooting war over Taiwan, I hope something like that never happens, and one of our fighter pilots pushes the button for that says fire on one of the anti-aircraft missiles in his or her aircraft, and it goes blop and nothing happens. Why? Because the Chinese uncovered the code seven years before. Uh, that would be a real problem. So we don't want to take chances with the compromise of national security information. And in the case of the Mar-a-Lago documents, for whatever reason President Trump took them there, or whether it was deliberate or accidental or someone else packed them up or he personally packed them, put all that aside, the fact of the matter is there appear to be significant national security documents, some of which bear markings of the highest levels of classification of, of the most sensitive kind, were stored improperly. And I can assure you that whenever uh, anyone else would would whether they were a low-level employee or high-level employee, would not properly store documents to the point where there was a possibility, not a certainty, just a possibility that they were compromised, the intelligence community would take the worst-case analysis and say, well, we have to assume they were compromised. We're not going to take the chance. And let me give an example. Let's assume you, know, you lost your keys to your house in your car. The next day, someone shows up at your front doorstep and says, hey, I found your keys. I want to give them back to you. Well, that night, would you feel comfortable sleeping in your house? I don't know. You're going to change your locks, right? You're going to change your front door. Uh, you might you might be worried about your car because you can't change your car lock and, I don't know, uh, put a car alarm on. So same principle applies in the national security area. It's, it's a small example, but you get the idea. And we have to take that position. So that's why, for me, um, it was so important for the government to reclaim the documents, number one, uh, and number two, uh, to now undertake this national security damage assessment to say, now that we know what's in the documents, and by the way, some appear to be missing, maybe, what's the possibility that, let's again, take the worst case but still plausible example, that the Chinese uh, bribed a janitor at Mar-a-Lago, and by the way, I can tell you they do that kind of thing around the world, uh, and said, go in there and look at that storage room and bring us a copy of something. Is that possible? I don't know. Uh, it, we can't rule it out. And that's the problem. If you can't rule it out, you have to assume it could happen. Well, that's the assumption. 
thankfully, the 11th Circuit made the decision that is in support of that national security mindset. Do you have a crystal ball about uh, you know where this might go? I'm not sure where this is going to go. I, I happen to think that the 11th Circuit three-judge panel, which was unanimous, and I think that's important that it was unanimous, uh, is exactly right. Uh, I think Judge Cannon's decision earlier was was on legally incorrect grounds. Uh, but without getting into too much of that, this case, as I said, first and foremost, the federal government needed to get the documents back to make sure they're now in secure hands. That's point one. Second, they need to get the documents back undertake this damage assessment to see what was in there and how bad things are and let's do we really have to assume the worst case and 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 if that is what 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 does that mean hopefully they can also figure out what documents are missing that's a big question mark as to whether there's criminal culpability here that's a that's a separate decision uh some some prosecutors are going to have to make the decision i'm sure it will ultimately go up to the attorney general given the importance of this and the political sensitivity of it. And, and Merritt Garland is perfectly aware of the political sensitivities of, of the potential of, of indicting a, foreign, a, a former president. But on the other hand, the flip side is true too, which is um, we would, if there was criminal culpability and evidence of it, we would indict any, any person, whether they're high ranking or low ranking, if, if, they, if they improperly uh, took documents and violated a law. Um, so just the fact that this would cause a lot of political heat, I don't think is a particularly good reason to to not indict someone. But again, I don't want to get into that. That's going to be a decision based on the evidence. It's probably going to be months away before a grand jury makes a decision about it. Um, and then the Justice Department will have a classic decision of do they believe there's evidence of criminal culpability? And if so, by whom? It's not at all clear by whom. And are they likely to win in a, in a prosecution? The Justice Department doesn't undertake prosecutions unless they are on solid ground and they're not there yet. They may never be there or they may be there. We'll, we'll, time will tell. You know, it's really interesting, Glenn, because at the very beginning when you introduced yourself, you talked about your mentor who was a Nixon, a Watergate error yes. attorney. And yeah. Elliot there Richardson, was yes. Albert Richardson and there was the wherewithal then to do what was right. I actually had the good fortune of working with Elliot on one of the cases, the Supreme Court case that helped establish the principle of um, immunity for public officials or qualified public officials and absolute immunity in the case of the president. We, we were working on one Supreme Court case that did that. I had the great honor of writing the, the, the winning brief in that case. But one of the issues that we touched on also was this question of executive privilege, which has popped up in this case. I think it's very important to separate out the question of executive privilege, which has to do with um, whether the executive branch is obligated to hand over documents and information to Congress and to uh, and to the public and to the judiciary, given the separation of powers and we have three equal, equal but separate branches. And I might add the executive privilege doctrine goes back to President George Washington, who refused famously to hand over treaty negotiation information to Congress. We shouldn't. Sep we should separate that, which I don't think is relevant at all in the Mar-a-Lago documents. Why? Because it's the executive branch asking to see its own documents. There's nothing, nothing else here. Um, so that does. That's just a complete red herring. And I think the 11th Circuit recognized that. Um, we need to separate that from from what I've seen in the media, where some people say, "Oh, this is a terrible precedent because this means that people aren't going to give their candid advice if they know that years later it's going to be overseen." That is not the issue at all. That's a separate question about whether. Um, people can be liable for their advice later on. That's an immunity question. It has nothing to do with this. Nobody's. There's no suggestion in any of these documents that people are going to um, get in trouble for giving advice. These. This is the government's own documents. A couple of comments. One is uh, your your former mentor uh, established some precedent that uh, that that was uh, invoked apparently when uh, President Trump was thinking about appointing that environmental lawyer as the the new AG, and, and he was told you're going to have a you're going to have another Clark. you're going to have another midnight massacre on your on your hands, <laughs> Mr. President. So in any event, that. Uh, he was a very courageous person, and and, and we're, we're actually Perkins, who is fortunate enough that uh, Ruckel's house, who was, I guess, number two, uh, ultimately came back and joined Perkins Coup after after all that happened. But anyway, without spending too much of your time, and this may be divulging too much, but you know we do see that there's a lot of there's some empty envelopes there that have the the security markings on them, and you probably shouldn't and probably can't tell us that but it is i'm assuming there's there's a way that we can figure out what was in those envelopes i'm 
but but you don't, <laughs> you can you can just say David I'm not going to talk about that and that's my no, way. Uh, you know that's a that's a great question. I think that is a big issue. So uh there appear just as I I don't have any inside information. I'm just reading the news reports, but the news reports seem to suggest that there are a number of folders that were empty that said things that had labels on them like return to the staff secretary, return to the military assistant and the folder was empty. So of course the, the natural question is well does that mean the document was indeed Whatever was in there was indeed properly returned while in the White House to the staff secretary, and there's nothing to worry about, nothing to see here, possibly. Does it mean that the document was uh, was never taken in the first place? Maybe. Does it mean that the document was there and then removed by either President Trump or someone acting at his behalf in the meantime and is somewhere else in Mar-a-Lago? Maybe. Does it mean that, uh, in my example before, that uh, the Chinese spy agencies paid off a worker to go in there and just grab a couple of documents and run out. Uh, and maybe they're now in the hands that they shouldn't be. Maybe. Can't. Who knows? But the question is that you've asked is, how do we know what's missing? And that's that could be difficult. In the case of documents, which is a very small subset where we know the actual document number, there were only, I'll, I'll make this up just as hypothetical, there were only 10 copies of a report and they're numbered one through 10 and we know exactly where they are. And we can account for all of them except document number seven, well, you know, then we have a good idea that document number seven is missing. That's not typical, however. And most of these documents that are uh, of, of, the, of the nature that are here, according to press reports, are memoranda and um, national security reports, intelligence reports that would have been duplicated many times, again, in a controlled circumstance, but there's no way to know exactly which report is missing. And that's quite scary. That also gets to that um, point you were making, Glenn, about storage, proper, proper storage versus, you know, so where would these things normally be looked at? And I'm assuming that would have made a difference as to how it was treated or you know, no empty folders. There are very detailed, literally scores of pages on the proper handling and transmission of top secret documents. And uh, I remember when I had to transport them the few times, I hated doing it because I just didn't even like taking the risk or anything. But um, you know, they're they're logged out. They're signed out. Um, they're put in a briefcase with double locks. Uh, you can only travel from one approved direct point to the next direct. So if I, if I was going from the National Security Agency, say to the, I don't know, the Pentagon, I'm just making this up. I wasn't allowed to stop off at a Starbucks and get a cup of coffee in the meantime. I had to go directly nonstop. The whole point was we wanted to make sure that we had a positive chain of custody at every single moment for where these documents were. When they were reviewed uh, in, a, in, in a building, the building has to meet certain standards. You can't have a cell phone in there. You, the only limited number of people can be in the building uh, who, are, who have security clearances and so on and so forth. So there's elaborate procedures to make sure that at every single minute from the moment the document is born until it's ultimately destroyed, if, if that's what its fate is, um, that we can track it and know exactly who has seen it. And we always have to ask one personal question before things go, which is, so you left your last government job right about the time COVID was starting up. And so we always like to find out what book, what series, what activity, what kept you sane during that nearly two-year lockdown? I had a bunch of different things that uh – that didn't turn out exactly the way I thought uh, in in retirement after after uh, <laughs> after uh, leaving the National Security Agency. I actually thought I'd probably wind up being more involved in my old career. I wasn't sure I wanted to be go go back to being a lawyer, but I thought I'd get more involved in the old Wall Street world. And of course, I couldn't because of COVID. There couldn't there were nobody was having meetings or lunches or anything. Um, so I wound up and I discovered that I enjoyed writing and speaking about some of these national security issues uh, far more. And so that's what I've been doing for the past two years. And I, I feel like I'm continuing to contribute. I don't know if others agree, but at least that's my view. I've spent a significant amount of time on that. Um, I've also, uh, on a personal level, it led to a lot of good things because some of our kids lived with us like as they did with almost all sorts of parents nice. around the country, were able to spend some time <laughs> with us, uh, more time with us during during uh, the COVID period than would otherwise have been the case. So that was a fun family event. And I got to do some reading that I've been you know putting off for a number of years. I finally tackled uh, some some books by Walter Isaacson on life of Ben Franklin and others. So, oh, that's so uh, it, it's been a mix. It didn't turn out exactly the way I thought it would, but, I, but I'm uh, actually happy with the end result. For the listeners, we'll, we'll post a link to your website, which is great, which also has a links to many of your articles. We talked about off 
offline, we talked about the article you wrote for The New Yorker, which was apparently a bear to get done only because of The New Yorker's editorial standard. It's been a great discussion. And Glenn, thank you for what you're doing. Thank you for your advocacy. Thank you for joining us. David and Deborah, thank you for, for this opportunity. I, I hope uh, some of this information is of interest to, to your listeners. You have a terrific podcast, and I'm happy to uh, help contribute to it. Thanks so much, Glenn. Thanks much for listening to our latest incarnation of Decrypted Unscripted, Decrypted Unscripted Revisited. To support the podcast, please rate, review, and follow us on Apple Podcasts or wherever you listen. And if you want to learn more about the current state of data security or just listen to some of our past episodes, head on over to our website, decryptedunscripted.com. Decrypted Unscripted.